What's going on folks, Ted from Nerd Immersion here and it's time for a top 10 or rather a top 8 Tuesday, but this time on Friday. So my patrons voted and we're talking about top 10 homebrew classes. So these are brand new non-core levels 1 to 20 classes that folks have homebrewed. All of these are going to be coming to you from the DMs Guild. So I'll have links to the DMs Guild uh, pages if you'd like to go pick them up. They're also DMs Guild affiliate links. So if you buy them, uh, it helps me out a little bit. But yeah, it took so long to make this because homebrew classes are a lot harder to do than subclasses because you have to understand all of the mechanics of the class as well as all of the mechanics of the subclass all at the same time. And that is sometimes in these instances a lot because I feel like people really want to pack their classes with a lot of stuff so people will want to play with them. And I don't necessarily think that that's the best thing, but we'll get into that in just a bit here. But before we dive in and talk all about my top eight homebrew classes, let's talk about the sponsor for today's video, Describe. You're familiar with Describe, I've talked about them here before on the channel, but this is an online tool to develop immersive and useful box text for you to use in your games. Currently more geared towards DMs, though player related stuff is coming and you can see they currently cover all of the different options. You see here characters were a recent addition. And again, they have virtual tabletop integration. You can even see like the cartographer. This is a map. If you click on the different aspects of it, you'll get different box text regarding and items are coming soon. So if you'd like to have magic items, descriptions, and there's over 2,700 different scenes and they're updated about once a week with new information and new stuff added. And I thought appropriately to read one would be for sociopath because the murder hobo, I guess, spoiler alert, the murder hobo class is on this list. And since I'm on TikTok, I've heard Good For You by Olivia Rodrigo countless times, more than I'd like to admit, and Sociopath just triggers that song in my brain. So anyway, though you yourself are well aware of the villainy and evil this person has perpetrated, you find yourself almost believing their lies as they speak with a casual conviction that is impossible to understand. It is almost as if the clear, uh, this clear-eyed, charismatic individual was born without a conscience and does not even know enough to question or regret it. This is a person who will do anything when allowed, and there is little that a stranger will not allow them to do in their airy manner, never suspecting the danger until it is far too late. I also figured I'd show you uh, the quick the pricing model. There's a free membership, so there's a bunch of stuff you can access for free, and then there's a hero membership. That's the most bang for your buck. That's access to everything for $80 annually, or you can go to monthly down to $879, and then you can choose to pick and choose if you want just monsters or what have you. Uh, and if you use the coupon code Nerd Immersion, click the link in the description, that'll get you 10% off your first purchase. So thank you, Describe, for sponsoring this video. Let's go. Number eight. The Ghost Class. Now, the reason this is top of the list is, as, as far as I can tell, this class doesn't really operate 100% on its own. It is a best silver seller on the DMs Guild. It has 12 perfect ratings, uh, and it is only $2.95 to pick it up. So it was also updated as recently as May 26th. So you know that even though it was uploaded in October of last year, the creator is keeping things up to date. So basically what this is, is you are playing a ghost, but the problem with that is most of your abilities are tied to you possessing and controlling a creature. And, uh, well, it's not necessarily possessing and controlling. So in some instances, it's most of the time it's willing full uh, possession, and you do provide benefits to them. But in my mind, I'd want to be my own character, although I guess this is a good alternative for someone whose character has possibly died in the course of the campaign. You could bring them back as a ghost, as you can see here, this ghost uh, kind of talking to whatever this character is, fighter, paladin. And here you can see the different options. You have different supernatural powers and different manifestations. Those are kind of similar, I guess, to, I would say, like warlock invocations. But it is a very low HP. It's the lowest HP class we've seen. Uh, it's got a D4 hit dice, which is the lowest hit die possible, and we don't even have anything like that in standard 5e. And you can see that basically you have a, a bunch of different immunities and things like that as you are a spirit. Uh, but basically, yeah, it all kind of starts here with your possession ability, which is possessing a willing creature and becoming your host. And you could do a variety of different things to help augment that creature's abilities, granting them temporary hit points, advantage on attack rolls, 
uh, jumping out to possess a new target. Um, and when I was reading through, nothing, it didn't come super clearly. Uh, you can't be targeted while you're possessing someone, but um, you're providing benefits to your host, so I'm not 100% sure if you're possessing someone if you get your own turn. Uh, and you can see you get a variety of different things as you level up. Here's the manifestations. You can kind of cast augury, um, ways for you to kind of be restored and, you know, protecting your body and, and doing sort of mental telepathy things, moving incorporeally. And then I actually really like the 20th level ability journeys end, which you decide basically what you're going to do. Are you going to move on with your life and, you know, go to the afterlife or are you going to stay a ghost? And then your variety of different kind of unfinished businesses, as they're called, or your subclasses. And there's a bunch of different ones. There's basically a duty not done is kind of like a guardian angel. Malice unsated is more of like an evil kind of possession, a puppeteer, if you will. Mischief manage is more of a poltergeisty type. Restless blade is more of like a revenant type. So there, I like that covers a lot of the different kinds of undead. And then you can see your different manifestations here again are kind of similar in a lot of ways to Warlock Invocations. I think it's really interesting. I don't know if it's something that I particularly would want to play, but the fact that it has so many positive reviews, that's a best silver seller. It's only $2.95 to pick it up in the first place, and it's been constantly updated as soon as less than a month ago. Seems like the creator is behind it, and there is a variant as well at the end, um, the occultist variant here at the end. Uh, and they also put uh bookmarks in the pdf so bonus points for that number seven the pugilist everybody just gushes over this class it's a best adamantine seller it has four and a half review four and a half stars out of five on 245 reviews it's been out since 2016 updated in 2019 people love this class it's basically a fisticuffs class uh, it's been out for over three years, actually coming up on five years at this point, yeah. Uh, I got mine as part of the Sterling Vermin Adventuring Company Anthology, which is a best mithril seller. Uh, and this is, you know, 10 bucks, but you get a whole bunch of stuff. That's how I got mine, but you can get it individually if you like. So let's go over here and take a look at it. So basically, yeah, it's a pugilist. It's in the name. It is essentially you are a guy or a gal or someone who just punches people, right? That's your whole thing. Now, you can in, in use different weapons, uh, but it's basically a class that focuses on unarmed combat or, or brawling in some way. Uh, it doesn't have to be a monk. Uh, again, possibly some of this has been lessened with Tasha's Cauldron adding the fighting style that it has. But as you can see here in this table... Um, you have basically a fisticuff die, essentially, which levels up similar to a martial arts die. It, however, does go up to a d12. Uh, and then you have moxie points, which are essentially key points. Um, you are able to use light armor. My biggest thing that kind of turns me off on this is I think this has too much stuff. Look at this, okay? It has, you have no basic dead levels. You are getting something new at every level. And it just feels like a lot to me. And in the several instances, you're getting multiple things at the same level. So it just feels like a lot to me. Um, you get a little bit of kind of, they got iron chin here, which is uh, if you're wearing light armor or it says wearing light or no armor, your AC equals 12 plus your constitution modifier. I don't know why you'd want to have that if you're wearing armor, but whatever. Again, moxie is like key points, similar things that you'll see. You can get some temporary hit points, uh, do some extra unarmed attacks, and then either shove or dash. And then you can see there's a, just like, this is all base class features. And it just feels like a lot. You're getting something at almost every level. At least they kept ability scores the same, and you do get extra attack, which makes sense. Uh, you get your subclass at level three. You have the option to get, um, you know, let's see, what is this? More temporary hit points. See, this one says once you've caroused in a settlement for eight hours or more, carousing rules have kind of changed as per Xanathar's Guide, so it's not as good, in my opinion. Um, get some resistances. I like the Haymaker one quite a bit, though. You get, uh, you make all attack rolls with disadvantage, but in turn, 
your mac your weapon your damage does maximum damage die so if you're doing a d8 instead of doing a d8 it just does eight damage but the trade-off is you're swinging wildly haymakers dealing uh but you're taking all your attacks at advantage in the trade-off for more damage uh you know get it breaking past um resistances and stuff and then as we kind of scroll down you can see we have the variety of different subclasses arena royale is pretty much like a luchador uh bloodhound bruisers are sort of like a detective type i like dog and hound a lot which i didn't even remember originally seeing which is basically a brawler with a pet which i thought was interesting it says you know basically statistics of a wolf um and you're kind of stuck in the street being a brawler and you got a, a pup that's your friend uh, some of these rules could probably be updated with the kind of new way pets are handled, but they do, they take one of the more recent, uh, stances, so it's pretty good. I think some of the, the terminology could be shifted a little bit. You've got the Hand of Dread, which is sort of like, um, uh, spooky, uh, I don't know, I don't know how I would describe it, like, uh, I don't want to say undead, but basically you're charging things with kind of like magical energy, necrotic energy um and then piss and vinegar is uh, did i miss the one that was there was a drinking one is this it um there's one i thought that was a uh, someone who drinks a bunch um maybe it was that one i just skipped past it um and then we have the squared circle so you're more of a of a wrestler type um yeah so there's a variety of different types of pugilists here um, and I, I again, I, I think a lot of folks seem to love this class. It never really wowed me the way it wowed so many others. But let me know. I'm sure some I'm sure a bunch of you have played this class. Let me know your thoughts on it in the comments down below. Number six. The Spellbinder. Now this is one that I reviewed in full here on the channel in way back in the day. Uh, this one again came out in 2016, updated in 2018. It's a best mithril seller. And four and a half stars for 31 ratings, so does pretty well overall. And essentially, I really like this initially because it was an intelligence half caster. And I still kind of stand by the fact that we could use one, but the closest thing we kind of have now, I guess, is the artificer. But uh, we have paladins, which are charisma half casters. We have rangers, which are wisdom half casters. And I said we always needed an intelligence half caster to sort of round out having that. Um, and then, uh, we have our Spellbinder here, which my biggest complaint about this, um, aside from the lack of bookmarks, is the font. I don't know if you guys can see it, but the font, like, it just doesn't sit right with me. It just looks off, and it kind of makes things hard to read. But as you can see, it's a Spells Known Caster. It is a D10 hit tie. Standard stuff you kind of expect for it, and we have, uh, Light Armor, Medium Armor, and Shields. Um, again, a lot of these things that are outdated, right? We have fighting styles. We know we got advanced or extra fighting styles with Tasha's Cauldron. So there's the potential to apply more fighting styles here. Uh, and basically you are, um, I don't know. I'd say this, it has a document at the end that says what kind of inspired it, but like a little Castlevania, a little Vampire Hunter D, a little Constantine, a little Buffy the Vampire Slayer, sort of, a like an occultist type um, but I like the way it was handled. I like the spell casting abilities. Um, you know, it's a martial character primarily. Um, and you have different abilities to help you kind of overcome dungeons and different kinds of spells. And then you have your different paths, right? So the path of the Magus or Magus is kind of the anti spell caster type. They can even kind of steal spells. Path of the Seeker is someone who's out there kind of seeking out knowledge and things like that. And you have different spells associated with it. And then you have Path of the Slayer, which is your over-the-top one that's going to be dealing the damage. We have our variety of different spells. And then here you can see the notes, right? Uh, Van Helsing, Hellboy, uh, even Sailor Moon, Bleach, and so on. Um, so, yeah. I, I, there's definitely passion in this one. I have actually... I just recently got a comment, which is funny, uh, about that review I did years ago. And someone said they have a Spellbinder at their table. They're level six and they're very much enjoying it. But they said it was a little, in their opinion, a little weaker than some of the other classes. So you might need to do a little homebrew tweaking to make it be up to speed, especially if people are playing 
with the newer subclasses, which are significantly stronger. Number five. The Lacer class from Incarnate the Last of the Lacers. This was originally released in 2016 and was updated as recently as 2020. And if you love Avatar The Last Airbender, this is the source book, which is because that's really what it is for you. And the laser is essentially a bender, right? When you take this class at the beginning, you choose a style of lacing, whether that be earth, fire, water, or air, and you get a variety of different things. This has 103 ratings of four and a half stars. It's a best missile seller. I did an entire in-depth review of this years ago, but it has been since revamped, so I haven't had a chance to go back in and look at it again. But here it is. It is basically based, I'd say, around a monk mixed with a warlock. You can see you have elemental strike and key points. Uh, elemental strike is similar to unarmed strike, but it's just a basic use of an element rather than a punch. Uh, and then the forms are similar to invocations. And you can see based on the different types of elements you choose, right? So fire gets weapon proficiencies for scimitar and sword. Earth gets maul and warhammer, water, rapier, and whip, and so on. And they're kind of things that are themed after the types of attacks and damage that, uh, you know, big heavy swings with the maul versus, you know, flowing, you know, swip, uh, swoopy attacks like the rapier or whip for water. Um, and then you can see here's your basic elemental strike, which again, like I said, functions very similarly to a monk's unarmed strike. It does elemental damage. It has a range of 2060. You can use dexterity or strength, and then you can choose to knock people out rather than kill them. And you can do a bonus action attack if you take the attack action. You have your key points, whereas fire and earth lasers are using charisma. Air and water are using wisdom, which I like the differentiation there. Um, and then you have these things, deflection, power, blow, and surprising angle are similar to the abilities we get like with flurry of blows. We get a fighting style. Uh, and then we have here our lacing, which is there's these different forms. And if you were to go to the lacing chapter, you could see all of them and figure out which ones you could take and what form access you'll have access to. Uh, and then elemental arts is essentially your subclasses. There are five options. There is 10 animal style, which is available to anyone. Uh, but then there are ones specific to the different groups, right? So Eastern Shaolin is for fire, eight palms for air, moon for water, and Western Mantis for earth. Uh, and then, you know, we scroll down, we see as we're leveling up and getting different abilities, depending on what we chose as our style, we can get different abilities, fire, water, air, and earth as you scroll down. And then here are the elemental arts. I'm going to go through the Western Mantis style because I like earth bending and earth lacing. So uh, neutral Jing is, is your level three ability here, which is whenever you take the ready action, you're also under the effects of the dodge action uh, until you use your reaction or until your next turn starts. Sure footed at level six, basically you can spend a key point as a reaction to prevent yourself from being shoved or knocked prone. Earth's Embrace gives you Tremor Sense out to 20 feet, which kind of makes sense if you've seen the show. Badger Glide for one key point gives you a burrow speed equal to your movement speed and allows you to go through rock and it lasts for a minute. And then Precise Step at 18, you are immune to critical hits. And when you score a critical hit, it does additional damage die. Uh, and then if we were to jump over to the Lacing chapter, you can see that there are different forms and they kind of talk to you about who can get access to them, how the key point spendings work. Uh, and then, right, you can see these are just the fire forms, right? All of this list that you see here. Um, and then basic fire lacing is here, but you'll see things like, you could do things like fire, like different bolts and different attacks. And they, some of them are very similar to spells uh, that you'd see. I, I, like, I think counter lace is essentially the, the counter spell, but for lacing abilities. Um, and I think one of these is very similar. Again, I think Pyreball is Fireball. Um, and I forget if you're able to get access to Lightning with this. Uh, I know some different, you know, as you scroll through, you can get different access to different abilities. Um, it might be a form that gives you access to Lightning Bending. Um, but if we were to jump ahead, see here's the Air Forms, right? All of these different Air Forms as well. And then if we were to jump to, oh, we're still in the Forms, yeah. So a variety of different options. Here's earth lacing. You can see all these different ones as well. So I really, really like this. I played around with it a little bit. I even think there's some feats that are out there in the book to like intro lacing. So like if you wanted to introduce it but didn't want to introduce the full-blown classes into your game, 
uh, you could do that. But again, there are a bunch of subclasses in this book as a whole uh, that can introduce lacing. But I think for the, the, the homebrew class that I like is the lacer itself. I think it's pretty sweet, and I would love to get an opportunity to play one sometime. And if you have played one, let me know what you think about it in the comments. Number four. The Murder Hobo class. Now, who hasn't? I'm sure everybody here has played a game with a Murder Hobo at one point. This is a best platinum seller. It has four and a half stars for 78 ratings. It is uh, came out in October of 2018. And I wanted to review it right when it came out, but I never got around to it. And yeah, it is basically that jerk, rough and tumble kind of asshole character. And you can see all the subclasses sort of match that, right? We have Dipsomaniac, which is the drunkster, Kleptomaniac, which is the thief. We have the Nympomaniac about charming and stuff like that. The Psychomaniac about murder and the Pyromaniac, the one who wants to set everything on fire. So if we were to go ahead and take a look at the Murder Hobo class, we could see it is a D10 class. It is much a, uh, it has Bullying Strike, which is not a unarmed strike. It's just a thing you could do to deal extra damage to someone. Um, if they are smaller than you or the challenge or their challenge rating is less than yours um, because you are a bully because you're a murder hobo. Um, we get some fighting styles here and we get our uncouth behavior was which one we were just talking about which chooses your subclass. Um, the only thing I'll say is once again I feel like some of these are very heavy on features. Not that they not that you know they they can't be some of them you know some other classes do get stuff pretty much almost every level um but i just it always comes off that these give you too much stuff in my opinion but i think it would be a lot of fun i mean you know as long as your party and your dm is on board with you playing a class that is literally named the murder hobo and they know what you're about i think it would be okay i also like that they have pocket sand as an ability which i think is pretty funny um but yeah, I, and I, I think the variety between the different uncouth behaviors is pretty nice as well. Um, whether, you, you know, I mean, whether you're being stealthy or, again, uh, being a drunk. Um, we can jump down to the, the murderer type here. With, you got bloodlust. Pyromaniac has spellcasting because they're setting stuff on fire. So pretty cool stuff. Uh, like I said, I was really keen on it when it first came out. I really wanted to get a chance to play it. Um, my biggest complaint with a lot of these, and it's, it's a small complaint and you know, I, it's a, it is what it is, but I primarily use D and D beyond for my character sheets because it's easy. It syncs up with Twitch when I do streaming. And part of the problem is you can't put homebrew classes in D and D beyond. And that kind of bugs me because if I could build this out in D and D beyond, then one, it would help me manage it better without having to flip, like have this printed out at the table so I could flip and read through all my abilities. I'd have it kind of displayed there for me. And it would also allow my DM to see whatever I have. And then if I built it out, then I could share it and then anybody could use it. But that also might be part of the reason because I technically, I mean, this one was pay what you want. So releasing it on D&D Beyond essentially for free for people to use not an issue, but I, I think some of the other ones where you have to actually uh, pay for them, uh, people might be upset if you're putting it out there for free. Number three. The Blood Hunter. I don't think I really need to go into this too much, right? It's a best adamantine seller. I'm talking here about the 2020. Uh, this one came out right before the world fell apart last year in, uh, in January of 2020, and it was actually in support of the Wildfire Relief Fund for Australia. Uh, it's got four and a half stars for 347 ratings. I don't think I really need to go over it. A lot of people know what it is. I did a full review of it back when it originally came out in like the 2016 version, and I did an updated review for the 2020 version. You know, it has a variety of different options, right? You get this new one, you get all the subclasses. Um, let's see, do we get, we don't have bookmarks though. Shame on you, Matt Mercer. How do you not have bookmarks in your PDF? Um, but yeah, it's like a Witcher, right? That's how it all started was for, um, the D and Diesel thing, uh, with Vin Diesel. And it's basically, you're, it, it's not a hundred percent a Witcher, but it's very close, right? You can cut, you know, add your, your, uh, Hemocraft die and add extra damage and you have the different blood curses that you can use. 
Um, I've played one. I played the original version. I haven't played the updated version. Uh, I played the the original Profane Soul many, many years ago, back in like 2016, 2017, when it first came out. And uh, in our ongoing evil campaign, my, my younger sister is playing uh, One Order of the Lycan. And with the exception of basically one combat, she seems to be enjoying it quite a bit. Uh, so, you know, I, I think this version is definitely a lot better. I know a lot of people have issues with it, possibly saying that it's overpowered or something like that. And I haven't seen it in the, the instances where we've been playing. I haven't, again, played the updated version to get an idea of how much I could really break it. But she's playing the um, the Order of the Lycan, and in a party with a Bard, a Warlock, and a Barbarian, I feel like she's right there. I don't feel like she's outshining anybody, uh, or out damaging anybody, or we're just like so much better than her. I feel like it's a pretty good balance. Maybe that's just the party composition and the stats we have. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts. I know it's very polarizing, but uh, you know, hey, it's number three. I've got two more that I like better than it. Number two the merchant class now this one was a surprise for me i didn't think i was going to enjoy this one as much as i did and i really really do it is a best silver seller it came out in 2018 it was updated only uh two months ago in april uh and it is currently nine five star ratings so a lot of support for this one and i went ahead and took a look at it and i really like it a lot Probably more than I should. I don't know. Uh, but basically, it is a it is a spellcaster. Spellcasting similar to an artificer. Uh, but basically, yeah, you're a merchant. And one of the one of my favorite things about this, above and beyond just the class, like, is you could use this to build out merchants in your game. Like if you wanted to populate a a shop with a merchant with different specific special abilities. You could use this to do that, and then it would very much tell you what your person could and could not like enchant or something like that. So let's go ahead and take a little look at it. One of my favorite things here is you start with a little bit more money because you are a merchant, and you have your portable storefront, which is kind of uh, how you conduct business, right? You have a supply list and how to use it and restock it and what you can do. But I love this currency conversion piece right here which it says, don't limit your portable storefront supply to just items in the official books. Get weird with it. If you can think of a mundane item you'd like to include in your portable storefront, such as a box of nails, toothbrushes, or pillows, you can follow the con uh, currency conversion table below and use it to estimate the cost of items with their real world prices. The converted values are representative of one unit of the currency listed in the D&D cur currency column. So they're saying a copper piece is the equivalency of 10 cents in US dollars. An electrum piece is $5. A gold piece is the equivalency of $10. And a platinum piece would be the equivalency of $100. Which, you know, I feel like I've ha I've wanted to know, the, like have a conversion rate at some point. I can't pick, you know, a reason why. But I remember definitely having this conversation at one point. So, uh, to you know, you have uh, your spell casting, but it's got gold required here, which I thought was interesting. Um, whenever you have to have gold in hand, whenever you cast a spell, and you can exchange your spell casting stuff because you're you know you're a dealer, which I thought was kind of interesting. Or you can give your spell slots to somebody else that you touch, uh, and it says you know the spell slot becomes a spell slot of the respective creature's class and maintains its level. You cannot give uh, a spell slot to a creature that would have more than four spell slots of that spell slot level. So you couldn't, if they have four first level spells, you can't give them another first to bring it up to five. Um, but I also like that you can split up your spells. So for example, if you have a third level slot, you can exchange it for three first level slots or a first and a second. Uh, you may not have any more than four merchant spell slots of any level. So you can, uh, that, that you have that exchangeable casting. And then I also like had just the nomenclature of this component subsidizing. When a creature, uh, willing creature you, uh, uses the cast a spell action and declares the spell they intend to cast, you can use your reaction expend a merchant spell slot of a level equal to that spell or lower to remove any material components required for that spell. If the cost of the material components being removed is higher than the value of your portable storefront, the spell fails. And then you have your spell list here, and there are some new spells in this as well. 
So we can see you're good at appraising, which again, there's not great appraising rules of any kind in 5e. I would add that to my list of mechanics is like, how do I tell what something's worth? Um, and then, yeah, you have the ability to eventually, as you go level up, stock higher level and higher quality magic items and things as you gain levels here. Um, I like that you have an ability called Insider Trading and Business Tycoon at level 20. Um, and then you have your various guilds provide the different stuff you can do, right? So Apothecary here uh, for doing potions and things. Uh, and again, this looks like a lot, but it has to list out all the different kinds of potions, which again, if you wanted to allow someone to craft potions in your game and you weren't sure what you wanted to let them use, you could use these potion effects as an example. Um, and then they have blacksmith, right? So blacksmith, I think, is one everyone can get behind because how many times have you gone to a blacksmith or something in your game and said, hey, I would like this. Do you sell magic items? Can you enchant magic items? Well, if you were to make an NPC with class levels in the merchant class blacksmith, you could probably answer your own question. So you can see they can do different things like enhancing. They can break down enchantments, which I like, retool them to reuse them. So, for example, if you disenchant a plus one short sword that deals a d4 fire damage, you can choose to learn either the plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls or the additional 1d4 fire damage on a hit. Then you can use that enchantment elsewhere. Um, and then it says you get two attacks. Uh, and then there's Forge Master, right? Any armor or weapon you craft or stock in your portable storefront has one of the following properties of your choice without increasing the cost to craft it. Plus one to attack and damage, plus one to AC, extra damage or where it can reduce the damage. Um, and then you have kind of the esotericism, which is sort of weird magic and curses and occult stuff. A gambler, uh, and then a mariner. We have a pet dealer. How many games have you gone where people want to sell pets in the game and you don't know how to do it? You can have a pet dealer who does that. And then we have a swindler here, and then a traveler. And then a couple of new spells that they have here at the end. And then a feat which is Mugger, uh, where you can basically steal stuff from people when you attack them. I think it's really cool. I'm definitely going to be using it probably for me. I feel like this would be a perfect class that would fit in a Penny Arcade game, especially one with Omen Drawn in it. Um, but I think I'll definitely be using this to populate my NPCs when I want to have different kinds of enchanters in my game. Number one. And lastly is, I think it's pronounced the Taroki. I've reviewed this one in the past as well. I found this one on Tumblr of all places years ago, back in 2016, and I fell in love with this class almost immediately. Uh, it was updated back in July of last year, so even though it was four years old, it's a best Electrum seller with five, uh, four and a half, 40, uh, four and a half uh, stars with for 40 ratings. And yeah, basically, if you've ever wanted to play Gambit, this is basically the class to do it. But they have a very interesting and unique mechanic that I really, really like. And let's check. They do have bookmarks, so kudos to them as well. So it all revolves around a deck of cards. So you have to be willing to deal with the randomness of card draws. Now, I think that this could be a very fun way to challenge a player who's a veteran, myself included, and I was going to potentially play one at some point, but I never got around to it. So you can see you have your hand size here, right? You can hold how many cards in your hand, your cantrips, your spells known, and your spell level. Your D8 caster, you can see it right here. This is kind of the crux of the class is you have your card suits and your card types. So it basically, this determines how you cast your spells. So it says... Uh, you can draw up to your maximum hand size as a bonus action on your turn. Your hand persists until you finish a long rest. To cast a Taroki spell, you must play a card of the appropriate spell level from your hand. Any card in the deck can be used to cast a cantrip. To play a card as anything other than a cantrip, you must be of an appropriate level, meaning you can't cast a 5th level spell at level 2. Um, let's see, must be an appropriate level as shown on the card slots table. Once you cast a spell, the card is discarded until you finish a long rest. Your hand size increases as you gain levels. Uh, you can discard cards from your hand at any time without an action. Once the card is discarded, it is lost until you finish a long rest, at which point it returns to your deck. This includes cards which may have been left in other areas or even destroyed. To cast a spell at higher level, you must play a card of a higher rank when you cast the spell. When you do so, the spell is cast at the level of the higher card 
to a maximum of the highest spell level you can cast. For example, if you are a first level Taroki and you know the first level spell Cure Wounds, you and your hand includes a 10, let's see right here, we see a 10, a Jack, Queen, King, and Ace, you can play the 10 card, which as you can see here is for a first level spell, uh, you, to cast it as a first level spell. Your higher cards, the Jack, Queen, King, and Ace, can only be cast as cantrips until you reach the appropriate levels of the card slot table. So um, this was, uh, if you were a first level character, they could only be used to cast cantrips. But if you were a fifth level character, uh, you could use your queen card to cast Cure Wounds at third level. And you can kind of, I don't think I need to explain it too much, but as you get into higher levels, some of them break down by suits, right? So an Ace of Diamonds is sixth level, Hearts is seventh, Clubs is eighth, and Spades is ninth. Uh, you're obviously using Charisma here, uh, but they give you, says they said you could be more of like a card counter and switch it to Intelligence if you want. It doesn't really change much. Um, and then there are uh, different stuff here about what you can do. So you can force cards, right? That's a magician's kind of a trick where you put a card, you force a card to where you want it to be so you can draw the card you want. Uh, it says at first level, you can take an action to search your deck for a single card and add it to your hand, so long as you're not already at your hand limit. After you take this action, you shuffle your deck, and you can use this feature one plus charisma modifier time. So if you really need to cast a spell, you can find that card in your deck. And there's a couple of other things you can do, like stacking the deck, and your, your uh, game of choice is your subclass, which determines, you can see the different spells and things, lets you what determines what you can do. So we have a, and it basically is down to types of card games, right? So you have Blackjack, you have Euchre, and I think you have Mao, which, and Poker, right? So you have, oh, and Spades. Spades is a newer one. They didn't have Spades. Uh, so I'll use Poker as an example, because that's something that everybody can get behind. It changes up the way you play with the cards. So it says at third level, you can play any of the poker hands, which it has this winning hands as in poker, two pair, full house, three of a kind. Um, when you play a winning hand, you must play an entire poker hand of five cards, even if the winning hand you play does not require five cards. You can cast a single spell. Uh, you must cast a single spell when you play the hand, which can be from any of the spells from any of the cards in the hand. Uh, when you play a winning hand, you put a number of the cards used to play the hand into a separate discard pile called the Poker Pile. When you finish a short or long rest, take all cards in the Poker Pile and shove them back into your deck. So you can see some different things. So let's look at a full house. This hand contains three cards of one rank and two cards of another. When you play this hand to cast a spell which requires concentration, you do not need to make concentration uh, constitution saving throws to maintain your concentration when you take damage. And that's the benefit of you basically playing out five cards. So let's see what four of a kind would be. When you play this hand to cast a spell that targets only one creature that doesn't have a range of self, you can target three other creatures with uh, in range of this spell, discard all four of the cards, and put the last one in the poker pile. Um, and like you saw for Full House, it says discard the three same rank cards and keep the two off rank cards in your hand. So there's different ways to go about it. And, you know, four of a kind, right? That's very rare for you to pull that in any game. So that's the concept of it, and that's what always has caught me was the poker one. But then we have Hold'em uh, at at six level, so you can take a bonus action to place, basically playing Texas Hold'em. Place three cards in front of you as Hold'em cards. These cards remain in front of you for a minute, during which time you can draw up to your normal hand limit. While they don't count against your hand limit, they can be used in conjunction to make winning hands. Similar to Texas Hold'em, but instead of only having two cards for Hold'em, you have your whole hand, which definitely increases that. You've got three cards out there in front of you, uh, and then I don't think you get a turn or a river card either. Um, they're considered played whenever you make a winning hand and discarded normally. If the hold'em cards aren't used within a minute, they're discarded. So you've got three cards out in front and your full hand of whatever, however many cards you can have, and you can use them to play together. I also really like Cozy Table at 10th level. You can cast Leoman's Tiny Hut, but only as a ritual. And when you do so, you cast Tensor's Floating Disc in it to have a poker table inside the hut. So you can make yourself a safe dome to play cards in. And I always thought that that was really good. Um, and then I'll just go through all in here because we're at the end of the video. So target a creature within 60 feet of you as a bonus action. You and that creature each roll a d20. The higher roll is the victor. 
The victor of the roll has advantage on attack rolls against the loser. The loser has disadvantage on all saving throws from effects initiated by the victor. This effect lasts for a minute, uh, and once the effect ends, it's immune for the next 24 hours. And essentially, being a gambler and going all in, you're putting it all down to a d20 roll to see what's going to happen. So... There you go, folks. That is my top eight homebrew classes. I'm sure there's a ton of other classes that you guys love that I missed, but I was just going through the list of ones that I see, I've seen, that I remember, and that I thought looked pretty cool. Uh, again, I still would love to play these. I'd love if I was able to easily transition these into a virtual tabletop, especially something like D&D Beyond. It would make it a lot easier. Uh, but yeah, let me know. I'm, I'm very curious. Uh, I tend to... St- stray away from homebrew classes because I don't know I always find it's hard to keep them balanced and uh, I either find you know probably unsurprisingly that it kind of goes either way right it's either really really OP or really really underpowered and I when I homebrew stuff I usually try to design things more on the lesser power scale so that I feel like that gives people who want to play it the potential to work out with your DM that if they want to upgrade it and make it more powerful to fit in, they can, but rather I feel like it's easier to add power than it is to take it away. Um, at some point, I do promise that I'm going to release the Necromancer full level 1 to 20 class that I've been working on for a while. Uh, it's pretty much done at this point. I just need to f- get into a headspace and figure out how to release it on D&D Beyond so that you guys can all go check it out. So... Thank you, Describe, for sponsoring this video. Thank you to my patrons over on Patreon for voting for this as the topic for this week. By the way, if you don't know, I do have a Patreon. There's a link in the description. And one of the things that they get to do is vote on what the topics are for the top 10 videos. So while some of you may throw out topics for top 10s to me consistently or throughout there, I compile them all into a list. And I usually grab like six to eight of them, throw them in a poll and let the patrons vote. Whatever comes up as the number one is the video for that week and the runner up for that is the video for the following week and then we run a poll after that and we just keep going from there so thank you all so much for watching